Hello, since this uh, proof of the Coeria formula is going to be long and complicated, I thought maybe I'd start with a summary and a global picture of what will be involved in the proof and the main tools used in it. Recall that the formula we're talking about is this integral formula saying that to integrate a measurable non-negative function g on Rm, we can first integrate over the fibers of a Lipschitz function. And there is this query a factor, which is a necessary component given the example of, say, constant functions. Let's see what uh, the proof that we present will look like. Before that, I must mention that the, our proof throughout these theory series will be different from the one in the, the more standard one in Feather's book. And uh, in Evans and Gary P, which is basically the same proof with more details. Measure theory and find properties of functions. So in what way will our proof be different? Um, the first tool we want to use, and we have extensively discussed this in the area series, is that given Epsilon positive, there exists a function g, uh, that's bad notation, so we have to switch to, so g is the function, test function, but so f is Lipschitz, we can replace it with a function that is c1, more regular, such that the set of points where either f of x is not equal to f tilde of x or the derivative of f at x is not equal to derivative of f tilde at x, all the set of non-agreement between f and f tilde has measure less than epsilon. And uh, that will be the Lebesgue measure in Rm. So that was a very, very deep result, and we used that to give a proof of area formula. So this allows us to replace, basically, a Lipschitz function with a C1 function of a subset of uh, measure as small as we wish. Now, why do we want C1? What is the difference between having C1 versus Lipschitz function? The answer is the implicit function theorem. Remember that if you have a C1 function where and a point in the domain where derivative has full rank, then the fibers are smooth C1 manifolds. But there is a deeper cor corollary of the implicit function theorem and uh, it's sometimes called the constant rank theorem. But we will not use that terminology and keep uh, mention uh, calling it a implicit function theorem. And uh, the claim of the implicit function theorem, the version we intend is the following, that if you have a C1 function, okay, if you have a C1 function into Rn is C1, and the rank of its derivative is the maximum possible n at a point x0, somewhere here, then the claim of the implicit function theorem is that, that there exists some open neighborhood of x0, uh, this blue shaded region that I have 
shown in the picture such that you can diffeomorphically transform it to another region in our M such that the fibers of the map become uh, vertical copies of Rm minus n. Okay, we have C1 full rank, so we expect the fibers, the part of the fibers within this blue region to be C1 manifolds, which you can see in this picture. So the part of the fibers within the blue part will be M minus n dimensional C1 manifolds. That is uh, the implicit function theorem that we know. What the stronger implicit function theorem here is saying is that there is a um, C1 diffeomorphism from U into um, its image, another open set in Rm. So these are subsets of Rm. So this is saying that there is a C1 change of coordinate systems so that for the map f composed with phi inverse which goes from rm into rn uh, the fibers are exactly vertical copies of rm minus n and the image of blue region here is the blue region back there why is this so significant for the coarea formula? Because then the proof of the coarea formula reduces to Fubini's theorem. What I'm, I'm not telling you is that one has to take good care of the Jacobian and how it transforms under these changes. Other than that, um, philosophically, this really gives a quick proof of the query formula for the blue sets. Now, if you have a C1 function, then, okay, let me, let me, so Fubini's theorem plus the study of how the coarea factor, factor, transforms under this phi proves the coarea formula on the open neighborhood we designated you on the blue part. But uh, we had conditions, right? We had that FBC1 and also it be full rank. For C1 maps, uh, we can write the regular set, the set X is where rank of derivative of f of x equal n, uh, we can write this set as a countable union of sets as above. So every one point here has a neighborhood on which um, the, the, the claim above, the geometry above holds. Okay, what remains to be done is how do we deal with the set where rank of derivative of f of x is strictly less than n, which we de denote as the critical set of the function f. Um, we know or it's easy rather to show, it's just right, it's a fact that the coarea factor of derivative of f of x equals zero if and only if 
rank of the derivative of f at x is strictly less than n. So the one side of the coherent factor, so to prove coherent formula, we must show that um, okay so on the critical set which is a measurable set those are technicalities the integral will be zero no matter what g you take therefore you must show that the integral the double integral is also zero and that is equivalent to saying that for ln almost every z that you take from the target the pre-image which is f inverse of the singleton z integral over this set produces nothing so that can happen only if it has zero measure otherwise we can take some g which violates that um, okay the part of this within the critical set is zero okay and that will be one of the theorems uh, we will prove so that's the first question so other than proving it via implicit function theorem for the regular set of c1 functions um, the first question is how to deal with this critical set and that is how to prove this last claim The second question is, there will be a set where the original Lipschitz F will not be differentiable. So C1 approximation of F can never happen um, on all of the domain. That's no surprise. The function uh, absolute value of X you can only approximate uh, off a set of positive measure, albeit that set can have very small measures, you have to sacrifice an open set around zero to estimate, to replace it with a C1 function. So there will always be, so here will be your domain in Rm. Um, you can, using that C1 approximation theorem, um, you can sacrifice a small set and outside that set, everything is nice. The function agrees with the C1 function. But you have to sacrifice a set of positive measures to get C1. So you can never make that sacrifice um, the empty set. And if, and you cannot even make it measure zero set, but even if you did, the, the problem doesn't end there. Um, Okay, so the quest, second question is, there will be a set where the Lipschitz F will not be differentiable. So C1 approximation will never ha happen on all of the domain. What this means is that no uh, differential calculus, say, will apply to the null set where f is not differentiable. Well, let's say you, you uh, let this epsilon go to zero and you exhaust your domain by c1 pieces. At best, you will end up with all of your domain except for a null set. And you, before you celebrate exhausting your domain up to null set, I, I um, 
let you in on some bad news. The area formula is not immediate for null sets. Okay, this may be a little bit surprising that um, usually we just ignore null sets. That's why we call them negligible. Uh, but in this particular instance, they are not negligible. The reason being that when we say a null set in the domain, so HM null set, we, we're talking about HM null sets, and M can be bigger than N, can be huge uh, from the point of view of or um, h the measure h n so that's the that's the whole point uh, that when you say null set it's h m null set but it can have very large h n measure in fact if you have r n sitting inside r m with h m measure it is negligible but with h n measure of course it's the whole r n and nothing is bigger n dimensional than that and I uh, also it's worth mentioning that even Fubini's theorem is not trivial theorem is not trivial on null sets actually one of the uh, very commonly used applications of Fubini's theorem is just to show that if you have a null set I have a hard time drawing null sets uh, either you draw too much then they are not null or you draw too less then there's no picture to show so but anyway so suppose a inside r2 is null that means l l2 of a is zero so one of the applications of Fubini's theorem is to apply Fubini's theorem to the characteristic function of a um, supposing a is measurable which will be because it is null set um, to to deduce that okay so it's used to deduce that for almost every so Fubini implies that for almost every x in R, so here is one particular x, the intersection of A with the vertical line at x is L1 null. And this is only uh, almost everywhere because I can actually put just a whole vertical set here and uh, that doesn't make it make make being uh, l2 null go away the set is still h2 null but for that particular value of x the fiber is actually all of r1 and it's h1 is infinity very far from being l1 null but for almost every point this will happen and there is no way uh, around proving this uh, by not using Fubini so that this all goes to explain why query formula is definitely not trivial even for null sets and because the function is not even differentiable at that point what tools are you going to use to study that so for points where your function is differentiable you estimate it by its derivative, its linear map, and linear algebra comes in and whatnot. But when, where f is not even differentiable, that's the end of the um, limits of calculus. So how are we going to prove this? So the, the way out of this, okay, so co-areas formula for null sets follows from 
a very important theorem called the coarea inequality, which says that under the same assumptions as in the coarea formula, integral of h m minus n of the fiber of z uh, intersection with a set a d l n of z here are n is less than or equal to a, a constant a dimensional constant so this will be just put a uh, volume n dimensional volume volume of the n-dimensional ball, unit ball, m minus n. These are the same constants used in defining hm. And then this will be Lipschitz constant of f to power n, power of the, the dimension of the target space, and then measure of the set a in the domain. Um, so pretty much the picture is the same as in the query formula you have your rm you have your set a it's just measurable can be really crazy here are fibers of the function f we've seen even for smooth functions sometimes they are funny okay and they go beyond a of course too but we're interested in the intersections with a um, so And so this measure of the domain bounds that integral of measure of fibers. So in particular, if the measure of the set A is zero, then for ln almost every z in Rn, so this integral on the left is zero, that means for almost every z, uh, the thing that is being integrated is zero. So m minus n, f inverse of the singleton z intersection with a is zero. And that, that uh, together with the fact that the query of factor vanishes, I mean, the integral of the query of factor also vanishes on a, uh, verifies the query formula for null sets immediately. So that takes care of the null sets. But this um, query inequality actually uh, promises a lot more. Remember that to estimate a Lipschitz function with a C1 function, we have to we had to sacrifice a set of very small measure epsilon, and this is great news because if this is less than epsilon, and epsilon is very small, then this means uh, that this integral is pretty small and therefore we can if, if we ignore a set of epsilon measure if we ignore a set of measure less than epsilon and prove the query formula on the complement of that set um, we are only epsilon away or some multiple of epsilon away from proving it for the full domain one side of the both sides of the query formula are different only by a dimensional constant times epsilon uh, compared to doing the full domain. So now that we have the query of inequality, um, that actually helps not just deal with the null set, but also with um, sets of small measure, therefore allowing us to um, reduce to C1 functions by sacrificing a little bit of the domains. Also, you may wonder why we would want a query inequality if we are going to prove a coarea formula. The answer is that um, this inequality actually holds in way more general setting. In fact, for any Lipschitz function from any metric space into another metric space. And uh, instead of M and N, you can have any Hausdorff measures where S and T do not need even to be integers. And uh, that was actually 
uh, the title of my first paper with Piotr Haywash was uh, the Coeria inequality and it, it uh, was dedicated to proving it for general metric spaces. Anyway, so, so far we have used two deep results in the proof of the Coeria formula. Let me um, put it here. So area in equality, um, sorry, formula. We used the implicit function theorem after approximating the Lipschitz function by a um, C1 function. We, as mentioned, we cannot avoid using coherent inequality. There's at least one null set where you don't even have a de derivative to begin with. The other result um, that I wrote down, but I didn't actually give it a name, is what I call the weak Sard's theorem. Uh, we will talk extensively about this when it's time. The strong Sard's theorem says that under more regularity for the function f, um, the pre-image of almost every point does not meet the critical set of the function. This critical set being the set where the derivative is not full rank. The weak Sard's theorem is this result that we have here in the box. It doesn't say that the pre-image does not meet the critical set. It allows the pre-image to meet the set, but it's on a negligible part of it. Um, but the good thing about it is that it requires F to be only Lipschitz. So we don't, it's not really a weaker sort. The assumptions are weaker, so is the conclusion. So that will definitely be needed. And the proof of source theorem is based on some adaptation of the proof of the area um, inequality here. So we will put C here in place of A and then prove that this quantity becomes zero. Although this quantity is not zero necessarily when... Okay, so that will be a very important step in our proof. Um, so these three results help prove the query formula, um, but also from this implicit function theorem and the weak sort theorem, we get some, some other important result, which is that almost every F inverse of Z, that means for almost every Z, this F inverse Z is H M minus N rectifiable. It almost immediately follows from this and this. So the implicit function theorem, remember, te te uh, gave us this fact that you can exhaust the regular part of the domain by these blue sets where pre-images are exactly manifolds of the right dimension. So part of F inverse Z, which meets these union of blue sets, gives us the manifold part of that pre-image. And then this sort says the part of this F inverse Z, which crosses or intersects the critical point, the critical points in the domain only picks a negligible H M minus N measure. And that is exactly saying that F inverse C is H M minus N rectifiable. Um, as I mentioned, the proof of weak sort theorem is based on adaptation of the proof of the query inequality. And now I have this last surprise for you, which finishes the proof. And that is what I call the coarea boat.
and that I will refer to many times in the future. So that's a sail boat. Here is the sail. Maybe a different color would have been nice, but I'm happy already with this. Let me see if this trick works. There you go. So uh, maybe yellow. Yeah, that's nice. And then let me do this blue, some water. Okay. So if you want to follow the travels of this beautiful boat, hang on with me. Um, make sure you subscribe and like my videos so that I know you're following. Any comments, any questions, please, please put them in the chat. So I have calculated for now that uh, my 10th video will complete this whole job of proving all of the results I've mentioned in this one. So see you in my next video. Thanks a lot for hanging, out, hanging with me today and uh, have a wonderful weekend.